Hello, Frizzle Fellas. In one word, the Joseph Bridgman books are ruminating. Joseph Bridgman is an average Joe who discovers that he can naturally time travel. Book one is him using this ability to attempt to save his sister who disappeared when they were little kids. And then as the books go on, the series transitions more to him working with and sometimes against the other time travelers and time police, etc. So first, I think you need to know what kind of time travel book this is, because of course there are a few different types. Is this time travel where the rules always stay internally perfectly consistent? No. Is this time travel where it always makes sense? I'd say yes. It's not hard to follow what the timelines are. It's not hard to follow what the missions are. This book is very, very much readable. And honestly, the worst section of these first three Joseph Richmond books, and it's not that bad, but it is the worst, it's when the time travel gets more close to hard science instead of fiction. Because there's an entire portion of book one where Joe and his friends are trying to figure out what are the rules of this time travel? How does it work? And his physics friends are doing the calculations and he's having his own mental breakdown, etc. But that was the slowest, most boringest part of these books because the time travel isn't really relying on all of these science equations. It kind of follows them. But the time travel is much more about feelings and fate. Because the mechanism of the time travel is that Joe naturally has psychometry, which is where he can touch an object and kind of feel memories out of it. And then he can use that feeling and those memories to travel back to that time period. It's more of a touchy-feely thing that's driving the time travel and not the logarithmic equations. So when the book slows down to have them do all of these test jumps to double check all of their numbers and calculations, yep, that was the part of the book I liked the least. Though I do admit part of my annoyance at that book is that they didn't explain the math thoroughly enough. I was very curious. But the book would have been stronger throwing out all of the math calculations, slowing down for the science parts. Because that's not the heart of this time travel. And that's a thing that I'll discuss more a little bit with books two and three, is that time itself is almost like a sentient entity that is guiding the time travelers. Fate plays a major role in this series. But like I said, no matter how hard or soft the time travel is in any specific scene, it is always very readable. And that's one of the things that I love about this series is the writing style. Not usually something that I care that much about, but I love how easily readable this writing style is. And then every now and then it'll just take a step back to take a paragraph to ruminate on life and say something philosophical in connection to the ongoing action. And then we'll jump back into the action. And I really appreciate all of those. I like those little asides. They are just adorable. And the characters in book one were like, okay, and relatable, but not fantastic. Particularly Alexia, the love interest, which I'll talk more about how that love plot pertains to book two. So in book two, Joe loses Alexia, and he is very cut up about this because they had a thing in book one. And it is one of his major motivations and drives throughout books two and three is trying to get Alexia back. <sighs> and this was annoying because they didn't really have much of a thing in book one because the relationship portrayed in book one was mostly a working relationship with some sentences implying more of a getting to know you falling in love montage. And then finally we had a scene where they are proclaiming their love for one another and kissing, and then it's gone. And now the book is expecting me to mourn the loss of this relationship that I didn't really feel in the first place. And it's not like I'm surprised that this science fiction book's romantic subplot isn't very strong, because unfortunately many sci-fi books with romantic subplots, the romantic subplot isn't very strong. But when so much of the future book's drama and motivations are depending on you believing in this romance, and then in book one, there isn't anything helping you root for and believe in that romance because the entire relationship development is glossed over, that doesn't work. But now let's set aside that complaint and talk about more things that I really liked in books two and three. Through Joe's time travel, he gets to see what his life would be like in two different timelines, one filled with tragedy and one filled with money and opportunities. And the exploration of the two different Joes, how this affects his personality and outlook in life is so fascinating. Because the Joe from the money and opportunities timeline is really good at the short-term happiness. He seems very satisfied in life. He's having fun. He's a playboy. He's good at making money and he enjoys it. And the Joe from the tragedy timeline is really bad at short-time happiness. He is 
almost constantly in a funk, his life is terrible, he's barely holding on to money, and he is, in general, very despondent. However, the Joe from the Money and Opportunities timeline isn't very good at long-term commitment happiness, and the Joe from the Tragedy timeline is. Because that tragedy for Joe helped him get more in touch with his emotions, helped him really realize what's important in life, helped him become ready for commitment to relationships. And because of that, he is in an emotional position to build a new life that the Joe that didn't have that tragedy isn't emotionally open for. And I love how the perspective that our Joe gains from these interactions leads to new decisions, leads to him choosing to prioritize friendships and relationships over money and business, because he sees that money and business can't always make you happy, but fully committing to other people can. And looking at all those different timelines is interesting, but it does feel like Joe is always fated to succeed in the broadest strokes, because time is calling the shots. Time is guiding and sometimes kind of forcing the time travelers into doing what it wants for the world. And I feel like it gave the time travel missions too much plot armor. For a lot of the moments during book two, it felt like the novel wanted me to be in suspense of, can he complete this mission? But because he was getting so many pushes of fate and coincidences and interesting instincts to push him along towards the correct course of action, I was never on the edge of my seat wondering if he would succeed. And I still enjoyed all my time reading the book, but I think the book needed a boost of drama from somewhere else, which I do think it delivered in book three, because we weren't getting the drama from wondering if he was going to complete his time travel mission in book two. Quick shout out to Vinny, the sidekick companion and guy in the chair of this book. Fantastic. I love him as a character. He didn't provide the drama I was looking for, but I do love his wholesome influence on this book. I love how he is so ready to roll with the most ridiculous time travel claims. I love the slightly skewed relationship Vinny and Joe have, where the timeline of their friendship is kind of messed with due to all of the time travel. And so Joe is entirely comfortable with Vinny, but Vinny is not yet entirely comfortable with Joe, so he's doing things like over-preparing for their meetings and cleaning his house, and Joe's like, I've never seen it this clean before. It's comedic, and again reinforces how much of a delight it is to have Vinny in these books. Now let's talk on book three. My favorite of the three by far. I fell in love with book three. Confession time, I read book three before books one and two. Yes, it was on purpose. I have an experiment of reading series out of order. And if you want to hear more about my conclusions, I will link the video down in the footnotes once I make it. In this book, Joe gets to be the sidekick to different time traveler, Gabrielle. And their relationship is abrasive and drama-filled. And because of their parallel quests in the past, there is a little bit more tension of will they actually be able to complete both? And Gabrielle was likable, even when she was abrasive, which isn't something that's always easy to pull off. One of my favorite little pieces of book three was how it took its time in showing us why Joe emotionally was motivated to do the things he was doing. Why did he want to go on these time travel quests? We really got in touch with his feelings, which is pretty constant throughout the series, but especially shown in book three. But the thing I loved most about book three is after we've been eased into the time travel world throughout book one and book two, or I assume you have because you would have actually read these books in order. In book three, meeting more and more time travelers, we get more and more hints, things that Joe is going to do in the future with other time travelers that they remember because it's their past, but he does not yet know about. And I have so many theories because it feels like every time he meets a time traveler, it's either they already seem to know him or they say, oh, it's nice to finally meet you. So he has a reputation among the time travelers. Honestly, I would bet money right now that he is going to one day found the time travel police, or maybe his sister will do it, but like he's gonna be involved somehow. And again, the ending of this book, as with all the other books, made me want to cheer. It was the perfect balance of wrapping up all the plot lines and then giving us maybe a little bit of teaser for what's to come and leaves me on the edge of my seat, excited to read book four. I rated these books on average, 4.3 stars. If you made it to the end of the video, leave a clock emoji so I know you're there. Subscribe for more videos on Frizzle Fridays, and thank you for watching.